Hi, Carl Zakis here, agency consultant. Welcome to this month's August 2020 agency office hours. Excited to answer some questions about agencies like yours, uh, about overcoming some challenges to make life easier. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, if you're watching live, go ahead and introduce yourself on chat. Uh, would love to hear where you're from, what you're looking forward to focusing on this month in August of 2020, uh, and, uh, and your agency name. Uh, so thanks so much for joining. Uh, we also, if you are joining live, we also have a poll. Feel free to vote in the poll, uh, checking in, what are you seeing today about your agency sales pipeline? Uh, what is that, that speed on the pipeline looking, looking like? All right, uh, we'll be doing four specific questions today in the agency hot seat. Uh, as a reminder, don't share anything you don't want recorded because this is recorded. Uh, so uh, first up, uh, Ana Laura will be sharing a question about business development, specifically growing your agency beyond your network. Uh, what do you do for that? Uh, David will be sharing a question about revenue models, specifically the idea of billing by uh, partial FTE by, by team members. Uh, Stephanie has a question about pricing, specifically about when to raise retainer prices and, and how much. We'll take a look at that. Uh, and finally, as time permits, Christina has a question related to employee onboarding uh, and, and how that interacts with account management. When you hire someone new, uh, how do you go about introducing them to clients, uh, uh, to those, those new, new team members? Uh, if you are not on that list, feel free to share your questions in, in chat. Uh, and you know, the group may be able to, may be able to help out. Uh, and um, you know, look forward to, uh, to, to diving in. Uh, and so if you are up on one of the four hot seats for today, uh, when I call on you, go ahead and unmute yourself and we'll, we'll dig in on your question and um, you know, go from there. Uh, so thanks so much for joining. Um, oh, and I do have a few links to share. Uh, thanks for voting in the poll. Looks like almost everyone has voted. Um, wanted to share about a couple upcoming events. Uh, if you're interested in improving the time you spend on sales, uh, I'm doing an event for Sharp Spring later this month, August 27th, 2020, on improving your sales ROI. Uh, I'm also doing another event for them in their Agency Acceleration Series, which has speakers like Ann Handley, Jay Baer, and others. Um, and I'll be the second to last speaker uh, in December. I will be speaking right before Seth Godin, who's the final speaker, uh, speaking about agency operations. Uh, I just shared the link for that. Uh, finally, if you're interested in uh, boosting lead gen uh, through content marketing, That'll be my focus for my training webinar uh, in October, and that is open for registration. Now, if you are a current client or if you have the Agency Profitability Toolkit, uh, if you're a current client, you have free access, you have the toolkit, you'll get the recording later. Uh, and if you want to join it live for q and I have a 50% coupon. So in that case, send me an email and I'll get that sorted out. All right, uh, before we go into uh, the first question, uh, from Ana Laura. Um, let's share the results from the poll. Uh, if you voted in the poll, so uh, looking at the list on the poll, uh, let's share the results. So uh, I had asked, what are you seeing today about your agency sales pipeline? The biggest answer is 36% that the pipeline is slow but getting faster, uh, and then sort of mixed from there, uh, similar amount, slow and staying slow. Uh, one person said pipeline has stopped completely, um, and good to see that about you know a little bit over a quarter of respondents that uh, uh, or it's it, it's sort of going moderately fast uh, plus not sure. So if you're in the category of things aren't going as smoothly, I think some of the discussions we'll have about biz dev today and revenue model should be especially helpful um, as you're sorting out how to get that get that moving. Uh, so, uh, Ana Laura, um, you are up first. If you could introduce yourself, uh, repeat your question for the group, and then we can we can dive in. Great. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. I'm super happy to share it at this time with you all. Um, I am based in Portugal. Uh, I'm not from Portugal. I was born in Argentina, but moved to Europe a while ago. Um, and I started my agency, uh, I'll say like a year ago, officially. So it's quite, everything's quite new. 
um, I moved from uh, corporate to freelancing to building the agency and my background is in marketing. So um, the first uh, struggle, uh, big struggle, uh, as most of you probably have uh, this year is um, selling. Um, but um, I guess um, it's interesting because I never really had um, an issue with that. I always have, you know, a good amount of clients and like if, if there's not an opportunity happening, there's another one developing. Right. Um, but it, so I see that um, the way I set, set it up really works. Uh, the issue is that I never sold anything in my life. So mm. I'm, I, I guess that the issue for me is like understanding uh, how to, uh, in terms of networking, everything's great. Um, and and that, that works for me, but I, I don't know how to access to uh, people that are outside of my, my network. Um, yeah, I know the theory and I know LinkedIn is there and you know, there's a lot of different options, but I was wondering if anyone here has any, you know, and you Carl, of course, uh, recommendations on uh, how to, uh, you know, kind of like get to people that are, are outside of that network uh, and expand the, the sales opportunities. Um, because the great thing is that it works without uh, doing a lot in that yeah. sense. Uh, yeah. But, you know, there's only like a limited number of people that will ever need your help uh, from your own network. So, yeah, that's my question. For sure. Well, thank you. Uh, and for everyone who's listening, uh, if you have some ideas, please share them on chat. I uh, would love to hear what, what you're doing to expand your own business development beyond, beyond your network. Um, so I, I would say uh, this is a common problem that agencies run into. Uh, usually in the first few years of business, like for a long time, your network is good and, and you know, find, finding business. But as you grow, it can be hard to sustain that. So the question is, you know, that, then what? Some of that will depend on your target market. Uh, for instance, are you focused on small businesses? Are you focused on enterprise? Are you focused on a particular niche? Um, in your case, um, who is your ideal client? So what's the profile of that target persona? Um, ideal client is, mm -hmm. I'll say more like enterprise uh, and uh, it's for mostly like consulting uh, or marketing auto automation and mostly part of it. So it's a, it's a very specific uh, market. Um, so um, yeah. Uh, ideally that which is bigger deals uh l longer term uh and uh yeah that's that's the ideal one got it uh and with enterprise and then sort of longer term marketing automation of course the nice thing about marketing automation is it lends itself to ongoing retainer deals and we'll talk a bit more in a bit about how do you raise prices for your retainers um and is there a particular industry focus within enterprise or it's sort of all large corporations um, it's a mix, but, um, I'll say B2B, um, education and yeah, anything like the tech or B2B, uh, and education, that's the main, um, yeah. So two, two pieces, uh, one looking at content marketing and thought leadership in particular, what can you do to get in front of people in your target market who are focused there? Uh, you know, for instance, within education, who, what are the decision makers in education reading? Uh, for instance, in the CMO group I run, you know, the chief marketing officers, brand side, you know, I'm regularly hearing examples about, you know, articles from Harvard Business Review. Now, HBR is difficult to get into, you know, that, that's not a, an easy PR result. Uh, but, you know, there'll be other things like CMO.com, you know, which is we've now owned by Adobe and others, you know, sort of smaller publications where that's one of those, you know, you get the one article and you lever up, you lever up. Um, and of course your own blog can be helpful too. Uh, to what extent, uh, sort of initial piece, to what extent are you using thought leadership in your, your self marketing? Uh, that's a very good question. I am. And I'm actually now uh, in the process of um, hiring someone that can help me um, to write more content because I don't have enough time to. <laughs> yes. So, yes. Yeah. So having a person that can help me there because, you know, like I can have a blog and everything, but if it's not SEO optimized or it's like very hard mm -hmm. to get people to land uh, there. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like, you know, it's interesting. It's doing marketing for yourself. Uh, it's, very funny, but I met a lot of people that are like on a similar situation where you're like, oh, you're working a lot and your own marketing is not even great. 
yeah. uh, in that sense when it comes comes to content and everything. So you, I think that's alone. interesting. It, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, the challenge, of course, is, you know, the shoemaker's kids or the cobbler's kids, yeah. uh, you know, it, it's a common challenge, but you still need business. You still need to find those, those clients. Uh, yeah. So bringing someone in is helpful, you know, because then they can focus on creating content. Uh, one of my shortcuts for content, I shared this in my, in my email newsletter recently, uh, is around answering questions from real people. I mean, like what we're doing right now. Right, you know, um, my plan will be, of course, to get things transcribed and turn some of our conversations today into future blog posts. Uh, and so, you know, looking for opportunities to answer questions from real people is really helpful on getting content done faster. Uh, you know, for people who are more of a you'd rather talk about it than uh, than write about it, then well, in that case, get it transcribed. Rev.com, I'm a fan of that either their higher end uh, kind of high accuracy transcription. They also have an automated transcription that is not as accurate, but it's faster and cheaper. Um, that can be a good match if you know you're gonna need to do some editing anyway. Uh, so rev.com is, is an option there. Uh, and there are others too, um, but that's been pretty reliable. Um, you know, that's an option. Uh, also, if you need content, but you don't like writing at all, but you like, talking, well, video can be a good match. You know, if, if you don't enjoy writing, don't create a content strategy that relies on writing. Uh, the second thing that's coming to mind is around leveraging your network in a somewhat different way. Uh, so something I'll often recommend to my executive coaching clients is to do the, the thing where you download your, uh, your contacts from LinkedIn and do a review and take a look. Like, where is um, everyone these, these days? Um, because you probably will find from your past corporate experience, you know, you may have some coworkers from before who are, you know, now working in other businesses or, you know, have some sort of, um, you know, new role that uh, might be, you know, they, they might need your help. Um, there, there's a joke that uh, when, you know, when a new, uh, a new CEO starts, and that could apply to a CMO or otherwise too. Uh, you know, when a new person starts, they have three jobs to do. Uh, they need to hire someone, fire someone, and rearrange the furniture. Uh, that is, they need to show their boss that, you know, they're getting things done, uh, they're getting results. Um, and sometimes, you know, the downside is your agency is the one that gets fired. You know, that doesn't always, always work out, or it doesn't always work out well. Sometimes, though, you're the one who gets, um, gets hired, uh, that can come in handy. So um, let me share, uh, I'm sharing on chat, this is the export connections from LinkedIn tutorial, uh, where they explain how you can export the contacts. If you haven't done it lately, even if you have done it, you know, a year or two ago, it's worth doing it now, because you can see, you know, where, where are people these days. Uh, there is a twist, it used to be that you would get everyone's email addresses, they've shared it, due to new privacy settings, you don't always get everyone's email address, but you can at least get a reminder of the people, uh, where they are and things like that. Um, and that may let you be a bit more targeted in your follow-up. So technically that's networking rather than something totally new, uh, but um, that can come in handy. Uh, and uh, Heather, to your question, that is a free thing within LinkedIn. Uh, although I, I, I'm sure LinkedIn would love to charge for exporting your own contacts. Uh, you know, cur currently free, uh, they have again cut back on the level of detail you get on each person. Um, so from, from what we've shared, I, I, any follow-up questions on, on any of that? And, and again, for anyone listening on, on chat, chime in on, on what's worked well for you on expanding your lead gen beyond your, your network. Um, Ana Laura, follow-up questions on that? Um, I was just thinking, I, I think that, um, the um, content one is uh, the one that piece is definitely important. I think that's kind of like more like a long term um, thing that I'm working on and everything. I I won't see immediate results uh, for sure. I think uh, the using the existing network uh, bit uh, and downloading um, all the information I have on LinkedIn uh, might help a lot. Um, the one thing that I've heard lately, and I don't know if you recommend or you used it before, uh, which I'm I don't know if I, I will um, ever try that route, but I don't know if you have uh, any 
uh, thoughts, uh, which is um, um, reaching out to people uh, directly on LinkedIn. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people now use automation for that, which I don't know if it works or not. Um, but I'm a bit hesitant because I don't know if I want to reach out to people that I don't know and are potential clients saying, how do you struggle mm -hmm. with this or that? Um, to me, honestly, sometimes it's a bit too much because we all get these messages uh, yes. and I'm like, oh, I don't know. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to know if you have any thoughts on that. I know people do use the LinkedIn outreach technique, you know, where it's either, you know, looking at profiles or sending connection requests or what have you. Uh, to me, it feels somewhat inauthentic, but it, my sense is it does work. Um, but I mean, like, like you, I have the same concern of getting a very generic connection request or, or even none, you know, uh, your kind of no, no details to it. And I, I, you know, I'm wondering what, what's going on. Um, you know, if, if it's someone who seems like they might benefit from my help, if they reach out to me, I'll ask, you know, something along the lines of thanks for reaching out. Did you need help with something in your agency now, or were you connecting in general? You know, that's more on the inbound side of things. Um, the, the outbound side, I don't know, that, uh, there, there is that authenticity bit. It seems like there's a bit of a disconnect. I, I'm curious for everyone listening, uh, listening live, if you want to share in chat, have, what's your experience either on the receiving side or the sending side of the, uh, the kind of LinkedIn connection deal? Um, mm. I would love, love if you share. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you in that sense, like the, the outbound one is, uh, to me, I don't know, I feel like a bit, um, I don't know if it's because it's my own name there and I'm like, I feel like I'm spamming people in, in a way, but yeah. um, I don't know, I'm nothing against it. I might need to just try it. Um, but yeah, that's the only thing that I've got literally like so many messages from people uh, lately offering those services that I'm like, mm. I don't know if I'm missing out here, uh, but yeah. Yeah. I, you know, a, a client received a, an acquisition offer via cold email or it wasn't the, the initial offer. The offer was, you know, is, do you, would you like to chat further? Um, and he got to the point, you know, back and forth where eventually he was thinking, okay, it's time to sign a non-disclosure agreement and share some additional details. And he had this nagging concern as, as we sort of talked, uh, talked about it further, he realized, you know, he's wondering if there'd be a culture mismatch because, you know, they seem to be more cold outreach oriented. That's literally how they connected with him, whereas his focus is way more inbound. Was there going to be culture mismatch if they were out there cold, cold pitching people? Um, so, uh, you know, it's a tough situation. Um, I am sharing an additional article a uh, key thing, and this is for everyone, regardless of what you're doing for your own marketing, uh, whether that's through uh, more one-on-one -on -one outreach or something, something broader, um, I, it's a technique I call inbound branding, and it's three parts. So one, specialize, you know, focus on your target market, uh, whatever that might be. Then use thought leadership marketing to share useful advice and content that people can benefit from. And here's the third thing, and this is the thing where a lot of people drop the ball. That third thing is marketing automation. When I launched my website in 2013 for what's now Sakes a Company, the website had a contact page so people get in touch, a blog so that Google would start indexing things immediately, and an email opt-in from day one. Like I knew I needed an email opt-in, you know, from day one. Uh, as my, one of my speaking coaches said, Alan Hoffler, uh, the audience never loves you more than the moment you walk off the stage. So if someone finds your content, you want to make it as easy as possible for them to opt in so you can follow up later. And, and we're seeing that right now with uh, the uncertainty about TikTok's future in the US, uh, where you know, the description was about influencers on TikTok sort of uh, kind of fleeing to get people to join on other platforms. You know, if you're dependent on someone else's platform, um, they could take it away at any time. Whereas if it's your own email list, and you're following the relevant guidelines and, and you know, all that, uh, you know, it's your list, not TikTok's follower list or Facebook's follower list or what have you. So good luck as you're working through that. Um, and, uh, you know, if people, I see people have been sharing some further info. Um, let's see. So uh, some comments. Uh, 
you know, have done outbound in the past, but it feels so overdone and spammy these days, but do used in targeted ways. Uh, good experience with both, um, but part of a larger strategy. Love connecting with people unless they give me a sales pitch from the get-go. Um, don't try and sell through a LinkedIn connection, just genuine introductions, absolutely. Um, uh, and uh, noting that sometimes getting better responses from potential clients through LinkedIn than email these days, um, and then overall partnerships and, and certainly targeted outreach uh, makes, makes sense. Uh, I am trying a, a sort of a unique outreach following the Ad Age Small Agency Awards. I'm curious to see how that goes. I'll probably have a follow-up on that next, next month. Well, um, Analara, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, next up is is David uh, with a question about revenue models. So, David, uh, go go ahead. You're you're on. Sure. Here we go. Um, so, I have a a revenue model that's unique to me. It's within mm -hmm. agency that I'm working with. So, I'd, I'd like you to try to help me figure out if it really does make sense because they're pretty positive about it. Sure. Uh, the idea is that essentially a client would purchase a portion of a full-time employee mm -hmm. and it might be separated between a couple, but yeah. uh, for an annual basis. So for example, it might be a $180,000 retainer for the year. That's getting them 1600 hours, which is like 0.8% of a, uh, or 80% of a full-time employee. Yeah. And that's set at an hourly rate. So let's say 112.50 would get us to the 180 at that many hours. So we do this calculation. And then at the end of the year, we end up at some figure of hours. Um, we should try to be at the 1600 that we planned. Right. If we are more efficient, then we kind of just squeak out a little bit more profit. If we're less efficient, if we put in 1700 hours of our time, mm -hmm. We don't get paid additionally. We just lost a little bit of profit. Right. So that's the general model. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, you know, not used to this, so I haven't, I'm not so familiar with how common it is. Mm -hmm. um, it is with a large company, uh, multinational. Um, so maybe it is more common with those. I haven't done a ton of Fortune 100 work, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm trying to figure out: is that something we want to keep on, do more of, or do we just shift to? more of the package oriented, uh, value pricing oriented work. Got it, cool, well thank you. So th there is actually a model for that. So th this sounds a lot like the model of staff augmentation. Uh, it is less common in agencies, although when it, when it is there, it's often happening with more enterprise clients, like the larger clients you mentioned. It is very common within IT outsourcing, where uh, you basically have people often on site at the client site, they are employed by the contracting firm, uh, who is ultimately, you know, the the client pays the contracting firm, who pays the individual contractor to do the work. Um, a version of this happens in, uh, you know, within government roles, or at least in the U.S. as well, uh, where you know there are probably at this point millions of contractors uh, doing work. Uh, you know, there are some pros and cons on it. Um, one of the pros on staff augmentation is you've got a large chunk of revenue locked in, you know, uh, and although they are getting a discount typically for the commitment to commit to, you know, nearly a full-time equivalent, um, you know, you're getting that, you know, 40 hours a week or 30 hours a week or 20 or, you know, depending on what the deal is. Uh, so from a gross revenue perspective, it's pretty good. You know, um, and the other the other benefit from a convenience perspective is if you lose the contract, you either staff the person on a new deal or you part ways, and and that's that. There's sort of a modularity. Need a person, hire a person. Don't need them anymore. I would try to restaff them somewhere else, but if that's not an option, I mean, it's like they understand, you know, kind of thing. Um, so those are some of the benefits. And for anyone listening uh, on chat, go ahead and share, uh, you know, share if you've done staff augmentation at your agency or if you've considered it or, or otherwise, go ahead and share in, in chat. Um, you know, so there, there are some upsides. There are some downsides too. Uh, you know, depending on, on your overall agency revenue mix, 
there's a risk of a client becoming uh, a client concentration problem, more than 20% of your revenue. You know, you're basically putting all of these people into one client. Um, there, there's a risk there. Um, if, if the client individually is less than 20% uh, of your total, you know, total revenue, that, that could be okay. Um, you know, some other challenges, uh, you know, what happens if the person gets sick? you know, or, or otherwise isn't able to work? Like, what is your obligation to swap someone in? And how smoothly is that going to go? Uh, do you require them to be on site or not? I mean, with COVID, obviously, things are shifting more and more remote. Uh, but, you know, say they are, they are on site. Uh, there was a, a situation uh, about a large uh, lobbying organization uh, in the U.S., uh, that is uh, very polarizing and uh, is currently, uh, I guess, potentially maybe, or there's a lawsuit to shut them down. I'm not going to say their name out loud, but uh, one of the things that came out a few years ago, uh, or, or in the past year, uh, their marketing agency in Oklahoma, uh, apparently, it's, the article didn't describe it like this, but basically it was staff augmentation. The agency had people in the lobbying organization's headquarters in Northern Virginia uh, and, uh, you know, it seemed like they were supposed to be dedicated to just do their marketing. And it sounded like the client was complaining that people weren't spending 100% of their time on the lobbying organization. Uh, and I don't know what the contract was, but if the premise is, you know, you're 100% dedicated to this client and people see your team member working on something else, they're not going to be happy. But also, they might not be happy. Say, you know, someone walks by and they see them working on a different client while at the other, you know, headquarters or office. You know, they may not know that that person is only fifty percent, you know, dedicated. They just see they're, you know, goofing off or something like that. So there, there are some culture issues there. Uh, the other piece too would be, um, you know, do they end up getting more embedded in the client company's culture than in the agency's culture? Which I mean is a high risk because they're they're there like they're their day to day coworkers not exactly their legal coworkers but their day to day coworkers are the client company, um, and you you may find that um, especially because they're you know they're part of the other team's culture, um, you're also um, you know uh, are they going to make decisions that are you know ultimately putting your agency first. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe not. Um, I mean, that's a risk in general for account managers where account managers, if you're a good account manager, you tend to be something of a people pleaser and you want to take care of the client and, and that's good, but not if it means, you know, violating, uh, you know, scope and creating other, other issues. Um, and, uh, you know, again, if you've tried this or you thought of it, go ahead and share it on, on chat. Um, I see we've gotten one comment. Uh, we've considered it in specific sales opportunities or circumstances, but haven't engaged clients in this capacity. Uh, David, I have a follow-up question, which is for, for your clients, the ones where you're considering this, um, what, is, you know, what is the primary benefit to them from what you've discussed so far? Because that may help figure out whether it's the right match or, or not. Could you elaborate a bit on kind of why they're considering it? Um. You know what? No, I don't think I can. I okay. don't think I give you a good answer. I, I know that uh, there's one client that operates on this model, okay. um, and they've been doing this for say like eight or nine years. So mm -hmm. it's pretty indoctrinated in with them. So it's a question of will other clients want that? So that'll be just something I explore if they see the value of it and how to position that. And um, you know, I'm just I'm working on managing the risk of who we have now. Uh, just because what you're saying, like, what if our one person we dedicated is sick or can't work or what have you? Right. So it's a good point. So I'd say it's worth exploring, but exploring cautiously. And if you do some further digging on the idea of staff augmentation, it's less common in agencies, but it's very common in government contracting, IT outsourcing, things like that. You could probably find some additional resources to help help dig in. Mm -hmm. um, so th thank you very much. I appreciate your asking. Uh, next up uh, is going to be Stephanie with some questions about pricing. Um, and uh, in particular, when you've got a retainer client, uh, you know, what do you do um, when it comes to raising your prices? 
Um, it looks like she's not currently on the line, so I'm going to save that for a little bit. So actually, we're going to jump ahead. Uh, let's see. We have a question from Christina. She's not on the line either. All right. Well, um, there are good questions, though. Let me, I'm going to answer the question anyway. Uh, so uh, the question from, from Stephanie was, you've got a retainer client. When do you raise the retainer? And, um, and also what percentage, by what percentage do you raise the retainer? Uh, so some of that will depend on what the contract terms are, right? If someone has signed uh, a, you know, a 12 month contract or a six month contract, then don't be raising the contract before, you know, the price before the end of the contract. Uh, unless, of course, there is a scope change, in which case that would justify, you know, adjusting the scope and potentially charging more. Um, so that's, you know, that's sort of the starting point. Some of that depends on, uh, you know, what the, the contract deal is. Um, I just shared an article in chat, my article on how to raise prices for your current clients. So, you know, in general, whenever an agency owner is like, I need to raise prices, uh, you know, how do I do it? I would definitely start with your new clients first. These are people you haven't worked with before. They don't have experience with your pricing previously. Um, that's the place to start uh, in terms of, of raising your prices uh, because that's their first experience with you. With your existing clients, it's a bit harder. You may have some existing clients who never agree to a price increase if they've been used to getting a super low price along the way. So you know, part of that is accepting it. But you can raise prices for existing clients. And in the article, I talk about raising prices 50% for existing clients. How do you do it? Well, as I share in the article, one of the keys is to give people as much advance notice as possible. If you were to reach out to a client, um, and I, I'm curious if anyone has an example of being on the receiving end of this, where you worked with someone who suddenly raised your prices uh, and, and was like, it's happening tomorrow, you know, what was your reaction to that, to someone saying that the price increase was happening, you know, right now? My, my advice for clients and my, my goal for you, if, if you're going to do this, is to give clients as much advance notice as possible. Minimum of three months, preferably six months, you know, I, depending it might, you know, maybe you mention it in like April and you say it's through the end of the year or, or, or that kind of thing. The idea is that the more notice you give them, uh, they feel special because they're locked in at the current price. And when it's time to raise things, you can also weigh whether to give them some sort of an in the middle pricing discount. You know, so maybe prices for new clients have gone up 50%, uh, but as a client loyalty deal, their prices would only go up 25% or 30% or 10%. Whatever the number is, you're anchoring off the much higher number, but that only works if you've given them advance notice. Whereas if you were like, oh, prices went up six months ago for new people, we didn't tell you about it, but yours are going up now, that doesn't work as well. You know, I talk about the idea of doing things that are strategically free or strategically discounted rather than secretly free. If you secretly raise your prices, and it may not be secret, but if the client doesn't know about it, it's a secret to them, um, that's not going to go over as well. Um, if anyone has any follow-up questions or comments related to raising prices, uh, like, feel free to unmute yourself. I'm glad to talk a bit about that uh, before we go on to the next question. Uh, does anyone have any questions about raising prices at your agency? Or is everyone charging exactly as much money as you would like and clients love working with you and gladly pay plenty of money? Any, anyone? Gonna, as people are thinking, I'm, I'm also going to find an additional, uh, additional follow-up article. This is my article on value anchoring. Uh, the idea there is that if you can find ways to anchor the value of what you're doing or anchor the pricing to the value of what clients are getting, it's a lot easier to, to do that. Um, for sure, the stronger your pipeline. Um, I have an article on uh, client wait lists as well. Uh, the stronger your positioning, the easier it is to, to have the option of a, of a client wait list. Uh, whereas if your pipeline is sparse, um, that uh, it's harder to, to do that because you don't have enough people to do, to do a pipeline uh, or, or do the wait list because the pipeline is not that strong. Um, any any follow-up questions from anyone about raising prices? Um, hi, this is Natalie. Natalie, um, hello. Hi. 
Um, and I joined the meeting a bit late, so apologies if. Uh, oh, not 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 a problem. And feel, I miss. Feel, feel free to join on video if you like. Thank you, thank you. I'm uh, kind of in in a bad spot right One now. One of those which is days. Okay, late. not not a problem. Go go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to mention. So we have been raising prices, and part of that is we've been kind of growing through, you know, despite the pandemic, and um, and have raised on kind of new clients with with existing clients, I think there's a couple of things, you know, with existing clients who have been very cognizant of just the situations that they're facing right now. Yes. yes. Um, and it doesn't feel, it feels a little bit like kind of hitting below the belt to say kind of, we know you're struggling and we're going to raise prices, but yeah. it has created a scenario where our current our kind of long-term clients are, you know, less, less profitable than our new ones. Um, and then on the new business side, we've luckily gotten fairly little pushback on higher prices but then we have lost a couple opportunities on price recently to clients that we really wanted like they were a great fit for us mm. and so it retrospectively and like you know a little bit of extra margin i still would have rather to get the client um so right. those are just two thoughts around it and and to double check on uh their uh, losing on price um, what was the data point or what were the inputs you had on on that like the client said you know you, you priced it at x they're like, we went with the other agency that was, you know, 10% less or, or sort of what data did you have about that being the core factor? Yeah. So one of them explicitly told us that it was, they, they liked us and they made it sound like they maybe liked us more. Um, ah. the, um, and it wasn't clear. Hi. <laughs> hey. It wasn't clear whether that was, um, the, the bigger scope or scope plus higher hourly rate. Um, that's something mm. we want to clarify with them. Yeah. Um, the number overall came in higher. And I think if we came in at a lower number, we could have just done less for them. Ah. Um, but it's, is it hourly rate or is it just overall number? And that's kind of a struggle of, are we quoting something? We're quoting what's right for them. Like we knew right. if we went too low, we would be setting false expectations about what we can deliver. But then yes. I know there's, uh, you know, you can hear anything you want in the sales process and you can tell right. the clients prospects what they want to hear and get the deal. And then, you know, that's and, not a great and, way, you know, but that's something that happens. Well, and, and I think it's especially hard when you, when you lose a deal to another firm where you, you know, you might have ethics concerns and who knows what they promised, you know, but right. they said what the client wanted to hear and, you know, such as it is. And it's also worth considering that clients don't always like telling the truth if it's an uncomfortable truth. You know, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, I did an emergency support call with a coaching client a few weeks ago where they had a prospect that was 90% ready to move forward. They had done a pilot project for the client. They were planning to do a, you know, six-figure follow-up project followed by an ongoing retainer and it had been, you know, 90%. And I get a, a message from the agency owner on a you know, Friday night saying, bad news, that prospect just dropped out. Like, is there anything I can do to save them? So around 7 p.m. on a Friday night, we spent about an hour talking through the situation. Um, and one of the things they had mentioned, uh, the prospect had mentioned to the agency, uh, was something like, you know, we love the work you do, but, you know, we, we've had some setbacks. Uh, we can't possibly afford what you're doing. Uh, you know, and we wouldn't expect you to, you know, cut things. Uh, so we've gone with this other agency uh, we know they won't do as good a job as you, you know, but, you know, they fit the budget. Uh, can you send us all the files? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the agency owner was like, I, I don't know, like, is there some way we could save this or at least maybe get some referrals? And I said, I think they're lying to you. If they were sincere about valuing your work and wanting to work with you, they would have been in touch. They would have said, hey, we've had a setback. Um, you know, we originally were going to do, you know, $120,000 for the website. Now we can only commit 60. Is there anything you could do for 60? Right. They didn't even try to negotiate a reduction in scope to match the reduction price. They just said, we've hired someone cheaper, go send them the files kind of thing. And indeed, um, when the, when the coaching clients, uh, business partner spoke with the, their client or their prospect the next week, uh, they ended up yelling at her. Uh, and threatening to send things to their lawyer. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, and also, unfortunately, the agency had done some work that they hadn't gotten paid for yet. 
Um, good news is they were able to recover that eventually. But I think it's a reminder that people may say anything to get what they want, right. you know, especially if you haven't worked with them before um, or, you know, the, it's just uncomfortable. Um, you know, for, you, you don't want to deliver the bad news. And sometimes people choose to just disappear altogether. Um, so I, I, I'm sorry you lost those. Um, one angle to consider in the sales process is what can you do to make people feel safe with either saying no or you're saying no. You know, the Sandler sales training methodology gets into a bit of that about, you know, having the contract for the start of the call. You know, our goal by the end of the call is, you know, if things are matched, we'll discuss next steps. And if not, we'll, you know, we'll point you elsewhere. We'll let you know kind of thing. Does that work for you? Line says yes. Um, and, you know, you can also do that to an extent with prospects where maybe before the proposal, maybe they're deciding between you and someone else. Um, you know, what can you do to make it safe for them to say they've gone with the other person? Um, you know, so uh, it's a tough situation. Um, it, it is worth considering that if price is their primary motivator, there may have been some challenges or, or like they may have seemed like the dream client on the outside, but if they were going with the person who's 10% cheaper or, or, you know, what have you, uh, they may have been somewhat more challenging to work with, but, but either way, I'm sorry, it didn't work out. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Those are some good uh, perspectives. Yeah. Cool. Th thank you for, for, for sharing on that. Uh, so uh, we have one more in the original slot, which is about employee onboarding. And it looks like we will have, uh, I think, time for maybe one other question. If you, uh, if you haven't shared and you have a question you're wondering about, go ahead and share it in chat. Um, I'd love to, love to answer it. Um, one other thing about the power of pipeline. Uh, well, you know what, I'll, I'll save it if we have time about feast or famine uh, and what one of my clients has called the pile of crack analogy. All right, so um, we had that question about uh, and I'm, I'm seeing some people laughing. Well, all right, if you want to hear about the pile of crack, that's the Feast or Famine article that I linked. Um, uh, Juan Carlos, you mentioned talking about revenue sharing, performance-based business model. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know what? Let's, uh, and, and so resource management, who owns it? Okay. Let me, um, let me table those for the moment uh, and um, talk about the employee onboarding piece, and then Juan Carlos will answer your question about revenue sharing and performance-based agency model. So Juan Carlos, if you can get ready to unmute yourself shortly, uh, we'll bring you in and answer your question. Uh, the, the question we'd received earlier from Christina was about uh, employee onboarding and account management. Like specifically, uh, what do you do, uh, you know, if you're in a situation where uh, you've got a, uh, you know, new, new team member, um, how do you introduce them to you know, uh, to your clients, you know, to say, hey, this is your new person. It's a bit different if you've lost someone, if you've lost the account manager at the last minute. Uh, you know, in that case, it's a bit more of a, you know, panic mode. Um, if it's a situation where it's more of a planned transition, maybe, you know, their account manager hasn't changed, but you've, you know, hired a new strategist who'll be working on their account. Um, ideally, you would not put them on the account first thing, like, their very first day. Um, I just shared an article about account manager turnover on chat, so you can, you can see that there. Uh, because, you know, you may hire someone and they suddenly decide within a few days they don't want to work there. That's rare, but I mean, it, it happens. Uh, so, you know, ideally you have new team members working behind the scenes first so that they're working with their various colleagues, but they're not necessarily client facing day one. Now, I know, you know, agencies, lots of pressure to get people billable and filling in work that, you know, needed to get done. Um, when I joined my most recent agency as an employee, I joined as a project manager. Uh, day one, I was assigned to a client call for an ongoing client, a project for one of our biggest clients. Uh, and um, fortunately, I was not leading the meeting, but I was in the client meeting day one, meeting them and, and you know, trying to keep up with what was going on. Uh, so that was, um, that was an interesting experience. So ideally, the longer you can push off clients meeting the new person, the better. Uh, I mean, even if it's just a week or two, just to sort of sort out, is it a fit or not? Um, that's a starting point. Um, ideally, you've done a good job of screening people to make sure that 
you know, they have the client skills and client mindset. We talk about the idea of warmth and competence from the book, The Human Brand. Ideally, they're delivering warmth, like making clients feel special and competence, getting the job done as well. Um, you know, so if you have any follow-up questions on that, go ahead and, and share in chat. Uh, Juan Carlos, you are up now uh, to, uh, to share your question. Uh, you mentioned you had a question related to um, uh, specifically about revenue sharing and performance-based business models. Um, go ahead and unmute yourself and um, go, go ahead and share your question. Um, yeah, can you hear me well? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so um, we have a couple of clients that are starting to uh, become very significant in or um, income in the agency. We're an, uh, Mexican, uh, an agency based in Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and we're selling uh, real estate uh, with them. Uh, so we do marketing, sales enablement, uh, kind of a closed loop uh, service. Um, and they deemed us so strategic that they decided, they did, uh, to share some percentage of the sales with us. Nice. Um, that's awesome, right? But the problem is um, uh, we're, we're becoming like very dependent on, on this model and we don't know if, if we, um, uh, we're thinking about maybe doing a separate agency that does only real estate performance based. Mm. Uh, but also as we go into e-commerce, uh, we also see that that is a possibility. Yes. Um, and and the way we're doing it, just to give you some context, is yeah. we're taking we're taking a cutback on the on our full profit, which yeah. is thirty percent. That's what we aim for. Yeah. And 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 the client pays for everything, even for our services, at seventy percent. Okay. And and we, you know, uh, that's what we gamble with. Um, so that's how we're doing it. I don't know if, based on your experience, that's a good practice or a bad practice. Mm. Um, and we're doing it from year two. So the okay. first year that we work with them, yes. uh, since we don't know, uh, uh, so that's what we do. So uh, yeah. I'll just shut up. <laughs> I, well, I, I think it's smart about diversifying your revenue models. And you know the, the nice things about real estate and also about e-commerce around performance-based incentives. I, I just shared an article about the three agency pricing models, hourly, milestone, and value-based. Um, you know, in real estate, people are used to paying commissions. So the idea of carving off certain percentages is just normal, right? You know, you need to make sure that it gets done at, at the closing, but, you know, that that's built in. Uh, and when it comes to e-commerce and doing performance-based fees or partially performance-based fees, the nice thing is you can log into their e-commerce tool and see what the sales were. You can see what the attribution was uh, to an extent, depending on, you know, how they have it set up. Uh, so it makes it very easy as opposed to say, if you're doing marketing for professional services or for certain aspects of healthcare, um, you know, I, I had a client as a director of client services where they did a certain aspect of law. And part of what we had to do was train the, uh, the office manager to make sure to ask where everyone came from or the same thing for a dentist's office on like, and where did you find us? You know, kind of thing. Uh, those weren't performance based, but it would have been a challenge if it had been kind of thing. So, I think you're on the right track industry-wise for performance-based. Uh, I also like that you're doing the first year on a fee-for-service basis to decide is it a match or not. Um, I did a client engagement that included a performance fee, and I ultimately terminated things with the clients a couple months in. Um, if I had been relying on the performance fee, uh, that wouldn't have gone smoothly because, you know, I chose to terminate them. Uh, so... I think the diversification piece makes sense, both about getting the potential upside uh, and also building in some sort of guarantee in year one. So that makes sense. Um, you know, one of the things where I see people get in trouble is if there's uh, sort of fuzziness about, um, you know, how are things calculated? Uh, you know, there's a joke uh, about the idea of Hollywood accounting. Uh, the idea that, you know, if someone's getting a percentage of the proceeds of a movie or something like that, uh, the, the joke is you always get the percentage of the points, the percentage on the gross, not the net. Because the net, you know, after people subtract out, oh, this expense and that expense, and, you know, you can make, you could make a profitable movie unprofitable if you, 
you know, if you do that, except that the people who are carving off all of those expenses are personally either pocketing it or receiving the full benefit of it. So I, I think um, any, ideally any percentages are based on the gross, even if it's a smaller percentage of the gross than it would be of the profits, you know, like that, that would be a good way to think about it. Um, it's also worth considering, one other thing comes to mind with real estate, uh, you know, what happens if you do everything in your part, but they drop the ball? For instance, uh, at one agency, we had a uh, real estate related project. It was a real estate development. Uh, we were a subcontractor to the prime agency. And we were doing some work about like mobile app user experience design, some concepts, this and that. Uh, you know, so it was a small project for us, but it was pretty big for the other agency. And uh, what I later learned after the project just sort of stalled, I think we got through like round one of concepts, round two, and then suddenly like the other agency, well, they didn't disappear, but they, they kept making excuses like, oh, well, it's paused or the client's this, the client that. It's like, what's going on? What I later learned was that this particular real estate development, the other agency that had hired us, they were the third agency that had worked with this client since the real estate project started. And, and like they were doing fine. It's that the client was so flaky and they were having so much trouble actually getting it launched and this and that. Uh, you know, well, and you know what? 10 years later, the, uh, the project still hasn't fully launched. They've, they've done a bit, but uh, it's definitely not the scope of what they claimed it would be. Um, and any questions from what I shared there about, about the risk management piece? No, I, I think it's crystal clear. Um, yeah, we do have the problem of aligning uh, marketing and sales. Uh, so we are on their calls uh, weekly and we're trying Got to it. you know, work with the sales team uh, a lot uh, because we have a, a, a invested interest in, in that. That's what the client likes, but sometimes we get uh, to do consulting, like a 360 consulting throughout the whole company, fixing things that we are not paid for, but yeah. um, it, it's kind of working, but I don't know if it's a common model uh, within agencies. It, it is, um, I'd say it's growing, the idea of performance-based. Um, it is not a widespread thing. Uh, partly because agencies are like, well, we don't know if it's going to work or not, or we don't know if we want to work with the client or not, um, you know, kind of thing. So I, I do think it's smart to start with the fee for service. And, and then you can also mention that as an option to the client to say, you know, once we know what the work is like and, and this and that, for year two, we'll consider a performance-based or a fee plus performance-based approach. Um, and you may decide heading into that, you don't want to do that based on your experience with the client. Um, or it might be like, they're nice to work with, but they struggle to actually fulfill what they've committed to kind of thing. So I, I think you're on the right track. Just key is to do build in some of that uh, risk management. Uh, so Thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Well, thanks for joining. Uh, Natalie, uh, to answer your question about, uh, about resource management and who should own resource management, uh, ideally, resource management would be owned by the operations team. And if you don't have a dedicated operations team, uh, potentially a senior or your senior most project manager, um, make sure to dial back some of their day-to-day -day project management and retainer management responsibilities uh, if, if they're also overseeing resource management. Um, do keep in mind that resource management can go a little overboard. Uh, for instance, um, I did some work at, at an agency that at one point had three PMs. When I joined, I was one PM, and then we expanded to a second one again. And um, originally, the agency was using Microsoft Project for project management. I do not, in general, I do not recommend using Microsoft Project, although Microsoft Project is on my list of, you know, 70 or 80 different PM tools. Um, but when it comes to... Microsoft Project, at the time, they had a resource pool where you could basically manage resources across, you know, all of the different, um, all of the different clients. One of the PMs who managed the resource management pool, and um, it was very accurate, but one of the three PMs spent 20 hours a week keeping the resource pool updated. Uh, and so, I mean, that was a big, big impact on, on time. Um, and, and things like that. So it's, it's a bit of a bit of a challenge. 
Um, so that, that's where I'd start looking um, in terms of next steps there um, and, um, you know, kind of go, go from there. Any follow-up questions, Natalie, on that as, as, as we wrap up for today? Uh, no, no, I think that's great and in line with our thinking. So I might just connect with you one-on-one uh, -on -one to talk. Okay. Sounds good. Um, well, as we wrap up today, thank you everyone for, for joining. Um, I've, I just shared one resource, which is if this was helpful, join us next month at the next monthly office hours. Uh, if you're joining live, it is the second Tuesday of every month during this time slot, 12 to 1 p.m. Eastern time, New York City time. Obviously adjust that for, for where you're located. Uh, so I just shared the direct login. You can actually sign up for any event coming up in 2020 already and, you know, and then beyond uh, today. Uh, so if you're interested, if this was helpful, go sign up. Uh, you know, regularly getting dozens of people from, uh, from all, all over the world. Uh, and you're also welcome to submit a question. Uh, when you sign up, you, can, you have the option of submitting a question. Um, and then I pick a mix of questions that you know, are going to help the group in, in general. Um, so feel free to share that. Um, and I occasionally get questions about, is there a way to get my help without doing a much larger project, executive coaching, agency roadmap? Um, and earlier this year, I did launch a bite-sized consulting call option. Um, I just shared that uh, where um, you don't have to make the much larger commitment. Obviously, it's not quite the same approach, but um, you know, if you're looking for advice about you know, one big question or a couple questions, that can be a good way to do that. Um, and you can book it instantly, uh, fill out some info ahead of time, book it, pay, and all that, and you're good to go. Well, thank you so much for joining. Uh, Carl Sakis here. Uh, good luck with you and your agency and uh, in the coming month and the coming year. And uh, look forward to seeing you next month. And if you'd like one-on-one -on -one help, just reach out. I'm glad to chat, uh, if, you know, sort out of things for a match. Uh, and uh, thank you. And good luck out there. See you next time.